and we are live now. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. So I'll, I'll give the floor to Dr. Olubek Nurmuhamedov to host today's webinar. Over to you. Thank you so much. Um, first of all, uh, assalamu alaikum. So um, for everyone, um, good morning, good evening. I know that people from all over the world are watching us today. So uh, Nodra, first, thank you so much for um, organizing this talk. And so we'll be both co-hosting uh, today's event. And so today's presenter is Silvana Dushku. So um, I'm actually honored um, to um, introduce you all, um, you know, um, our uh, distinguished colleague, um, Silvana Dushku. So uh, my presentation, uh, my introduction will have two components. One is formal and one is informal. So now it's time for the formal component of the presentation, uh, introduction, sorry. So Silvana Dushku works as a senior language education strategist. Um, she was a director of the community language program, TESOL certificate program, and language program management certificate program at uh, the prestigious right, Teachers College, Columbia University. She has taught EFL, ESL for over 35 years and has been involved in language program development, curriculum and materials design and teacher training in Europe and the USA. Her interests include teaching and researching vocabulary and spoken English and applications of corpus linguistics and technology in ELT, right, in English language teaching. So this is the formal introduction. So in terms of, you know, I think uh, our audience needs to know two things about um, you know, Dr. Silvana Dushko because um, you know, we have a lot of attendees um, who currently teach ELT in Uzbekistan and elsewhere. And also we have colleagues in, 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 um, you know, who are watching Silvana's presentation in Chicago, especially colleagues that uh, somehow associated with Northeastern Illinois University's TESOL program. So just for those colleagues who are um, watching us from Uzbekistan is that Silvana has visited Uzbekistan so far once, right, in 2003. <laughs> She actually presented in a conference um, organized by the British Council called Language and Development. And so I've known Silvana since 2003. Um, um, she's both my uh, friend, colleague, as well as mentor. So, um, and, and she knows um, uh, Uzbekistan very well. I think you visited Samarkand and- Yes, right, uh, and, and mesmerized by it. Yes, so, but you have to come again. Now Uzbekistan is even you know, more beautiful than before. So. And um, you know, for the colleagues um, uh, uh, at Northeastern Illinois University, I, um, you know, I would like to point out that Silvani is also has also co-authored a textbook called Campus Talk. And I hope that Silva, today you will also uh, tell us more about your book, right? Uh, with with Edinburgh University Press, and co-author of that um, book is um, uh, uh, pr Professor Paul Thompson from University of Birmingham. So um, so she's the co-author of the book. And, um, uh, and uh, back in uh, what, like summer of 2018, um, some of our um, uh, MA TESOL students, right, uh, you know, um, uh, and took a look at uh, some of the chapters of the book and, and, and provided uh, suggestions, uh, you know, uh, to both authors. So somehow, you know, we are somehow, you know, um, know, you know, uh, what, what Silva worked on that book. So, and our um, students were privileged um, to take a look at the draft versions of the book and also give, you know, give comments. So, yeah, that's all about Silva. And, and, you know, I look forward to your talk, Silvana, and the stage is yours. Well, thank you so much. Thanks for this uh, warm welcoming note. Um, I would like first to um, welcome everybody. Assalamu alaikum, everybody. Good evening. Uh, good morning, wherever you are. Um, yes, and uh, at the same time, um, I would like to thank Beck, my dear friend and colleague, for facilitating the arrangements uh, for this webinar. And uh, in particular, I would like to thank Nodra for kindly making this happen. Um, so let's begin. So um, today's talk, um, as announced, is going to be on designing and operationalizing vocabulary lists. Um, before we get started, let me do a brief overview. And Beck, if you could move to the next one. Yeah, so first, uh, I would make a very brief review of the parameters or principles of vocabulary item selection 
for instructional purposes. And then we'll look at how to design an instructional unit vocabulary list. And third, we are going to spend most of the time on uh, looking at activities to illustrate how to operationalize an instructional unit vocabulary list. Now, uh, you can see there that I have, I have uh, highlighted the cover of a book by Professor Paul Nation, making and using word lists for vocabulary, um, for language learning and testing. Um, and that's for people who are interested in textbook writing, in um, designing standardized language tests, or for people who are involved in compiling dictionaries. Strongly recommend it. Uh, in today's talk, we are going to look at uh, vocabulary item selection and the creation of vocabulary lists for instructional purposes, for pedagogical purposes. So let's move on. Let's look first at the parameters of vocabulary selection. Um, I would like to throw a question there. And uh, in the interest of time, uh, I would not invite you to put your ideas in the chat, but uh, basically to write in your notebook, to write one or two parameters down. How would you select vocabulary, words or phrases to teach in a language classroom? Give it a minute. Um, and think about your own experience, your own um, principles or parameters in selecting vocabulary to teach in the classroom. Okay. Let's hold on to them. And then I would, I would like to invite all of you to check in the next slide, to check at the list of parameters for vocabulary selection as identified by research in the field. The first parameter is that of pedagogical purpose. Beck, if you could click on that. Yeah, that would be good to have all of them on the screen. I am going to unpack and talk a little bit longer on number one and number four. And I'm going to summarize each of um, the six vocabulary item selection parameters now. So as understandable, the pedagogical purpose has to do with why we want to teach the particular vocabulary item or a list of vocabulary items. Um, the cognitive load for the learner has to do with the level of complexity and difficulty that the vocabulary item presents to the learner. And just to exemplify it and cheer us up uh, this morning, if you guys can think of, a Mary, of the Mary Poppins movie and think of the supercalifragilisticexpialidocious phrase that Mary Poppins liked to throw here and there, uh, and compare it to pen and think about teaching words like supercalifragilisticexpialidocious, meaning long um, with a challenging spelling and pronunciation, uh, abstract in meaning, and um, at the same time, difficult to remember or difficult to collocate with other vocabulary items and compare it with pen, how easy it is to teach it, to exemplify it, to collocate it, to spell it, to pronounce it and so on. So think of high cognitive load versus low cognitive load for the learner. Functional load has to do with meeting um, the learner's immediate communicative needs. And those are generally determined by um, linguistic and sociocultural norms of the community that learners or learner are or is part of. Um, so, and this is not relevant only to vocabulary, it's relevant to teaching any part of the language, teaching pronunciation as well. We first teach, let's say, uh, minimal pairs that are of high functional load, frequent and salient, right? Um, compared to others that are of low functional load. Same for vocabulary. 
Relevance to learners' proficiency level is another key um, vocabulary item selection parameter, and we'll uh, talk a little bit more at length about it, but that's directly related to frequency of an item, you know, commonality of occurrence, and coverage, the number of words that a learner knows in a text. Um, they are, you know, I'm repeating myself, directly related to the learner's proficiency level and need to be considered when teaching vocabulary. Um, needless to say, we begin by teaching learners very high frequency and um, high saliency vocabulary, the, what you know, the 2000 word, 2500, according to Professor Michael McCarthy's latest podcast on LinkedIn. And then we move on to uh, higher vocabulary bands, right? Another uh, vocabulary item selection parameter is mode. So what are we teaching? Are we trying to provide skills and knowledge of spoken discourse or written discourse, spoken English or written English, right? And the last one as important is register that overlaps with genre, sometimes used interchangeably. So genre, as you know, is the variation in style of vocabulary relevant to um, the topic, the situation of communication and audience. Uh, to make it simple, um, there are different kinds of registers. Some that we are very familiar with as teachers are the uh, varieties of English related to geography, right? So what are we gonna teach? American English, British English, what? Um, at the same time, we think of levels of formality, um, slang, casual slash informal and formal English. What is appropriate under what circumstances um, for what topic and in what particular communication situation? So let's move on now to um, discussing the pedagogical purpose or purposes. First, as I mentioned before is, okay, why are we teaching this vocabulary item? What for? Are we going to support productive or receptive skill development? And by productive, as you understand, I'm talking about writing and speaking skills or receptive skills, listening and reading. Are we going to focus on lexical fluency development or on accuracy of usage of a vocabulary item? Are we going to pre-teach the vocabulary? For example, according to research um, in an ESP class, um, you may want to pre-teach the low frequency technical vocabulary in order to boost uh, vocabulary coverage. Or even simpler, um, before we teach maybe, or, or we show the students a video or we play um, particular listening text. Sometimes we pre-teach vocabulary to boost their comprehension of the content of the video and also facilitate the uh, post-watching or post-listening activities, right? Are we going to teach it new, something that the students have not been exposed before? Or are we going to review or recycle um, the vocabulary for example, we might be teaching unit six, but in unit two, there were words and phrases that in unit six are retaken. What are we gonna do with them? Are we gonna tell the students, oh, remember that we saw these words in unit two, or are we gonna be building up on those? Again, according to Professor Michael McCarthy, he advises teach the new by building it on the old, right? by creating this way stronger um, bound um, uh, lexical sets and uh, deepening the trace in the learner's memory, okay? Um, are we aiming at increasing vocabulary size? That is the number of words that learners know and um, the higher they go in level, the more we teach them about the uh, form and the meaning of word parts, roots or stems, um, affixation, suffixes and prefixes, because when we allow the learners to um, get hold of the, I call it the legal principle, how to put um, affixes together with stems and create um, words, that's how their vocabulary increases in size, right? 
uh, or are we going to develop vocabulary depth? So um, we start by teaching learners what we call the denotational meaning, the primary meaning, the first dictionary meaning of the word, the core meaning of the word. But then we go and explore the other set of meanings. We explore the phraseology or, or potential idiomaticity of the word. Um, the range of collocations, you know, the words of, you know, collocability and lexical constraints such as semantic prosody and so on. And there may be other pedagogical purposes that some of you have thought of that are not included in this list. Let's move on and look at relevance to proficiency level. So understandable, um, once you start teaching, your learners, you should be aware of their level of proficiency, the dominant level of proficiency, because there is no perfect you know, match of every single student in your course. There are often mixed ability classes, right? And here I'm showing the CFR, the Common uh, European Framework of References, the levels of proficiency um, that are uh, worldwide used uh, together with other uh, reference systems and systems of benchmarks like ACTFL and others. So when you conduct the instructional unit needs analysis, um, think about what unit vocabulary your learners know already. And you could ask me and say, okay, so what do you mean by unit needs analysis? Well, before you start the unit, you need to know what your learners know already, topic-wise, content-wise, and language-wise. What could be an example? A simple one. When I taught a unit on health to, let's say, low uh, intermediate students, I would divide the class into groups and uh, invite the students in one group to pantomime, to act up the symptoms of something like a particular disease or even the common cold that they might be familiar with. Another group would shout out, um, symptoms, the language for the symptoms, if they know any, and I would write everything on the board. Um, and another group would shout out if they know any terminology or any particular words related to treatment of those particular symptoms or that particular illness. Um, I would take screenshots of everything that um, I, um, you know, uh, kind of got from the students. And that would be something that would help me put together the vocabulary list uh, and prepare on the basis of this needs analysis, prepare to teach in this new unit. And the last issue has to do with pedagogical purpose of the unit, the instructional unit goals. So what vocabulary do your learners need to review or learn new in order to complete the end of the unit project, in order to complete the end of the unit, to, to take the end of the unit test, right? So the unit is envisaged as a series of enabling tasks culminated by an end of the unit project and or a unit test. So let's move on to the next slide. And uh, now look more closely at strategies to design a vocabulary list. Um, before we do that, I would like to uh, clarify the difference that I make um, just for the sake of this presentation between um, a word list and a vocabulary list. Um, let's move on with their definitions. So what is a word list? Uh, I've adapted this from Wikipedia uh, to make it easier for everybody's um, understanding and um, you know, engagement with this definition. So word lists are lists of lexical units, units of counting, grouped according to a criterion, for example, a frequency of occurrence, topic, semantic field, etc., either by level or as a ranked list for a particular purpose, which could be um, dictionary making, course designing, vocabulary learning and testing, and others. Let me show you in the next slide 
a few examples of corpus generated word lists. So the first one, although people think that even in the 1930s, there were um, word lists generated already, but the first one um, that is a corpus generated one is considered the general service list by West in 1953. Um, I won't go on every single list um, in this list, but maybe you guys are familiar with the academic word list uh, by Avril Coxed that um, a revolutionized textbook uh, writing, uh, dictionary uh, writing, and um, also uh, standardized language test development. Um, Coxed also in 2017 uh, developed the spoken academic word list um, and there are other ones that I would, especially ESP ones, English for specific purposes, vocabulary lists that are of great interest to explore. Nowadays there are also new lists like the academic formula list, the academic collocations list, English as a lingua franca in academic settings list, and so on. Dictionaries, as you can see in the next slide, also provide opportunities for students to build word lists and use them for their vocabulary learning, or to use ready-made lists offered by, as in this case, Cambridge Dictionary Plus, uh, you can see that um, next to them, um, they have the um, level of proficiency. And at the bottom of the screen where it says community word list, you can see that these lists are uh, topic relevant. And on the bottom right corner where it says test your vocabulary with our full image quizzes, um, the uh, Cambridge University Press gives you the opportunity to also test your knowledge of the vocabulary list uh, offered in the screen. Quizlet does the same thing. Um, maybe many of you are very familiar with Quizlet. It allows you to build word lists, but you also can um, employ, can use in various ways, the ready-made word lists provided by Quizlet. Let's look at two um, word lists that are topic or um, exam related in the next slide. So this is fun. This is much ado about stuffing and it's Thanksgiving vocabulary, uh, but it has organized vocabulary um, in categories. Like in the first 13 words, you can see cooking words. In the last one, you could see baking vocabulary and so on. Um, in the bottom one, the TOEFL exam, the vocabulary is also organized in a very helpful way for test takers. Uh, and what attracted my attention was the language of the test, the meta language, the language of instructions. So important for students because sometimes they don't even understand um, the instructions for an activity. And also what attracted my attention are the essential word roots and um, power prefixes because um, the learner's knowledge and ability to um, understand and use them, as I said before, boosts their vocabulary coverage and really boosts their score, especially in the most challenging parts of the TOEFL exam, listening and reading. However, let's move on. What I will be talking about today is vocabulary lists that are pedagogically treated in a way we say curated word lists to aid unit instruction, assessment, and learning. Uh, many of you are familiar with textbook, uh, Beck, could you go back? Yes, thank you. With textbook vocabulary lists, right? Um, they are organized by different, you know, uh, principles. This one looks like is organized by the part of speech. And at the bottom, you could see uh, phraseology organized by topic and function. This is from Interchange, textbook by Jack Richards, Interchange 2. One of my teaching assistants um, typed this list, and you can see it in the next slide. 
if you could move on, yes. And uh, when I saw it that way, I was perplexed myself, as uh, any of you would be, I believe, let alone brand new teachers, because Okay, the book is telling you that this is a vocabulary that you need to teach in this unit. How? Uh, how to prioritize it? Where? Um, how to assess it? Um, so what to teach new? What to uh, review or recycle? So I have banged my head against this wall as a teacher for 35, 36 years. And I came up with a small system for myself that um, I'd like to share with you in the next slide. It's a series of mini steps that any teacher uh, could use, I believe, to put some structure and uh, organization when the teacher uh, starts thinking of building a vocabulary list to teach and assess in a new instructional unit. So to reiterate what we talked about in step one, we always have to keep in mind our students' level of proficiency and also the pedagogical goals in the unit, the new unit goals. If we move on to step two on the right, of course, we need to conduct a unit needs analysis, which is what unit vocabulary do our students already know and what new vocabulary do our students need to know on this topic at this level for the purposes of, and we keep in mind the learning outcomes, for the purposes of accomplishing the unit goals and performing at the satisfactory level in the end of the unit assessment tasks and projects. In step three, to the left, um, what I would do is look at the unit text activities and tests and identify key vocabulary that I think I need to teach. Um, if I'm lucky enough to have a language summary as the one that I showed you that the book offers, I compare my findings with those of the language summary and I circle key vocabulary there. Then after sifting the um, vocabulary list in the making, I decide to first what to teach as new vocabulary and what to recycle, right? What to teach new and basically building on what old vocabulary, right? Again, referring to Professor Michael McCarthy's teach vocabulary, teach new vocabulary, based on previously learned vocabulary. In step five to the left now, I usually like to use some really simple um, online tools to determine the proficiency level compliance. So some of you may be familiar, and we are not going to click on it and in the interest of time, but uh, I would invite you to check them out. They are very easy to use two tools, Oxford Text Checker or Oxford 3000 and 5000. There are other text profilers, other text analyzers, um, like uh, there is the Lex one, there is the one that is building in the Coca corpus and so on. They are very, very common. But what they allow you to do is to get your list and plug it in, in a little box, and I'm referring now to the Oxford text checker. And then it is the program itself is designed that way that based on a huge collection of corpora, it will classify your list, your vocabulary list based on um, proficiency levels. And if you use Oxford 3000 and 5000, what you'll see on the screen after you click submit is your vocabulary list, but next to every word in the vocabulary list, you will see A1 or B2 or, so they are categorized based on the common European framework of references. And next to it, you will see also um, two icons showing, you know, if you click on them, 
the pronunciation of that particular vocabulary item in British English and American English. So then you get to decide what items um, pertain to your learner's level of proficiency. And if for a couple of items, you decide to follow Krashen's I plus one, so teach something that is one level up for a particular pedagogical purpose, you do so in an informed and principled way. Then in step six, um, what you'd like to do is, again, referring to, uh, you know, literature in the field, teach words in a mini context. Um, and the bottom one is teach them, teach words in company, right? Um, show your learners how this word binds with um, frequent collocates. So basically, you will need to include in the list the most frequent and relevant collocations. And you could use the COCA corpus to identify such collocations. Once you type the word, um, you know, in the COCA um, word info, it gives you the most frequent collocations that the word is associated with. And finally, you will need to take care of the look of the vocabulary list and how to make it uh, like easy to operate, to use by your learners. Can you make it interactive? And hold on to this thought because in the next slides to come, I'm going to show you how you can, and even for lower level learners. In the next slide, I'm going to show you a very simple vocabulary list. Um, so this is from a low intermediate vocabulary course based on uh, the Heinle at that time, Sengage Learning Picture Dictionary. Um, you know, students, when you use materials like that, they are flooded by pictures and a lot of vocabulary for every module. And this was module two. So you have to be selective, right? So the way I organized it is in the part of speech, the first column I put, you know, for, for every um, word that I've included there, as you can see, I just uh, um, included noun or noun phrases. And I also categorize this vocabulary to review in, you can see, basic collocations and new vocabulary to teach again in basic collocations. And in other vocabulary column, I included vocabulary that I didn't intend to teach in depth incidental vocabulary, vocabulary that I explained the meaning of, um, to boost word coverage in a particular activity or text, but that I didn't intend to assess at the end of the unit. Let's now move on to the next part, which is that of how to use, how to operationalize a vocabulary list. And I'd like to do it through activity illustrations. Let's start with activities for lower level learners. There is one more back. <laughs> yes, thank you. So um, first, everybody can think of, oh, um, how to put together, you know, visually a unit vocabulary list Okay, list all the words, you know, in a table or not, uh, and share it with your learners at the beginning of the unit. And depending on the, you know, the learning context your learners are coming from, many of them are so eager to memorize the vocabulary list. That's their first urge, right? Well, there are other ways of getting learners engaged with the vocabulary list and keeping their interest up with every class during that instructional unit. Starting from, you know, a simple dictation, and it cannot be you and the learners only, but it could be student to student, which is kind of boring, but basic. And moving on to maybe removing some vocabulary items or some collocates, for example, and then, timing the learner's completion of those vocabulary items at the beginning of a class, right? Um, or to make it even messier for the learners and a little bit more complex, you might ask the learners to re reorganize um, a part of the list that is scrambled. 
uh, not yet back. Um, it could be parts of speech, or it could be another part of the list, depending on how you've organized the vocabulary list. Now, the more fun ones are number three, four, and five. Ask the learners to act vocabulary up, to draw a vocabulary item on the board, or to think of associations, semantic fields, like, let's say, divide the class into two teams, and uh, you have a learner from one team pantomiming the vocabulary item, and the others find out what particular vocabulary item he is trying to act up draw it for the same purpose or create semantic fields like um, learners from one team shout a vocabulary item from the list let's say school and the learners from the other um, team they start shouting out words that are relevant to school uh, teacher student uh, notebook um, computer test and so on and so forth now be aware of social cultural differences uh, while you do three, four, and five. And I could share one of my experiences. I had a mixed nationality class. Many of my students came from Arab countries. I had students from Uzbekistan, from um, Mexico, from Japan, um, and other countries. One of the students was pantomiming the verb to bake. And the student did this gesture, if you can see me, right? Bake, put it in the oven, right? Um, the students from the, the group, you know, where all the Kazakh and Uzbek and the Arab students were, uh, they were not understanding it and they were shouting words that did not relate to the gesture. Finally, we unfolded the word and it was to bake. And all of them first burst into laughter and then started protesting because they said no in our countries the gesture for bake is this and then i left because when i was in uzbekistan Bek took me to a tandoori oven and i saw how you baked this beautiful you know like very delicious bread so i had to give the point back to my <laughs> students because it wasn't their fault right and um in six how to make the vocabulary list interactive. This is what I'd like to illustrate in the following slide. This is a slide from um, a former student and teaching assistant of mine, a brilliant one, and she was teaching low intermediate ESL students. This is a unit on storytelling, not telling tales like once upon a time there was a red riding hood, but um, conversational storytelling. You can see that the student organized it first by vocabulary to review and new vocabulary, vocabulary to teach new. And then she simplified the taxonomy. So rather than saying, let's say, uh, pre story pre announcers, she put it as story starters because she was trying to adapt it to their to the learners level. Um, and then you can see that she has included phrases there and collocations together with single words as well, warming learners up to formulaic speech used in storytelling. She has also included um, story phrases in the past, how you describe past events in a story. And in reacting to a story, she is including phrases that the learners can use for active listening. So she's building listenership there, right? Um, how learners express attitude, express stance, evaluation, surprise uh, to what the speaker um, is sharing, you know, to the story that the speaker is sharing. Passive vocabulary, the same uh, principle for um, exposing students to incidental vocabulary. Interestingly, please look at the bottom of the screen under description words. She uh, very thoughtfully included descriptors that we usually use to make the story um, more lively, right? But she is building new vocabulary there uh, on top of the old one because before um, this unit, we, you know, at this level, teach the difference between ed versus ing 
adjectives like embarrassed versus embarrassing. And also in pronunciation, we teach the pronunciation of ED endings. And so she's retaking it, she's recycling it, right? And asking the students again to use the words in bold, not separately, but in mini sentences to illustrate each item, each icon in the uh, set of pictures at the bottom of the list. Simple, colorful, easy to use by low intermediate ESL learners. Now let's move on to upper level learners, how to activate vocabulary lists uh, through activities for this particular level of proficiency. Um, this vocabulary list is also a vocabulary list from a storytelling unit, but this is for high intermediate advanced oral communication course. And this is taken from the campus talk, the book that um, just was published this past year, uh, which is a book that, again, addresses the needs of high intermediate advanced students um, and teaches effective communication skills uh, for use in academic and non-academic settings uh, for international students. It's a tenure, uh, like a decade of work together with um, uh, Professor Paul Thompson from Birmingham University. And it's uh, all research-based and uh, corpus in form. Now, if you take a look at this vocabulary list, you can see that the taxonomy has changed. So I use uh, a little bit more complex taxonomy, like pre-announcing expressions for story starters or conversation story ending expressions for discourse, like all of these two are discourse organizing expressions. And then stance expressions, like expressions of surprise or expressions of evaluation or referential expressions, like vague expressions. Uh, vocabulary to review is predominantly formulaic, as you can see. Um, there are single words like thing, right? As a, used as a vague word, like what's that thing called? But then again, following the same principle, teach new over the old, in the new vocabulary, if you could look to the right of think, uh, under new vocabulary, you see thingy and things or something, something like that and things like that and so on. All formulaic phrases that learners are exposed to and get a chance to practice and be assessed on. Excuse me. So let's move on to some activity examples right now. I have categorized activities in the next three slides um, in completion or close up activities, uh, identification activities, and corpus informed activities. Let's look first at completion activities. Um, you could ask learners to complete the missing turn in a two turn routine. So uh, the speaker and the speaker's turn and a listener's turn. For example, you could ask the learner to write a register appropriate complaint to match the given response. An example would be, I am monumentally sorry. So first the learners have to guess the register level, the level of um, formality, and then they will have to come up with a speaker's turn, a complaint that this particular response matches. You could make it even more complex and you can think of um, a multi-turn routine, right? Like a pre-request response, request response. And you could ask the learners to complete a missing turn in this sequence of turns. For example, pre-request. Um, Beck, are you going to be busy? Have you planned anything this weekend? Dot, 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 dot there, question mark. Uh, so I am moving this weekend and I could use a hand. Indirect request, right? And the response could be, oh, sure. Um, I could definitely give you a hand when do you want me to be there? So students have to guess the response to the pre-request. And it could be something like, uh, no, I'm not doing anything. Just hanging out there, relaxing. You could also ask students to complete statements of emotions, like I can't stand it when, 
and they need to complete the next. Or I hate it when, or it drives me up the wall when, and so on. Or to make it a little bit more complex with advanced students, you give them a table of um, inc incomplete, table of examples of uh, formulaic focus expressions. In a presentation, that, that could be language like, what I want to do now is, and these are focus expressions used to focus the audience attention on a part of the presentation. Then you could have the students watch an academic presentation and skim it and find examples of formulate focus expressions and add them to the table. So this is a completion activity because they complete the table, but at the same time, it's an identification activity like the ones that I'm going to show you in the next slide. So one of the common identification activities could be recognize the speaker's intent, the speaker's purpose in context. For, and we ask um, the learners to read or listen to an apology expression in context and identify whether it's the purpose is apologetic or non-apologetic. So the student may read something like, excuse me, this is my stop. And the student has to identify whether excuse me is an apology or is a non-apologetic phrase. Or it could be as complex as listening to, I'm sorry, meaning come again. The context is intonation, or if it's in a video, it's a facial expression of the speaker, that's it. But again, the student should be able to identify the purpose of the speaker, in this case, non-apologetic, right? Um, we could ask the student to review the given speaker's intent. So we give the students the speaker's intent. For example, the purpose of a compliment. And we say, okay, this speaker is making a compliment, but to ask for a favor. For example, I really love your cookies. I was wondering if you could share the recipe. I, I have a party next Saturday. And we want the students, based on this identified purpose of the compliment, to role play the routine, offer an appropriate compliment to match the purpose, and also come up with an effective response to the compliment. Next, we ask the students to look at the given response to a missing invitation. So the response is, thanks, I'll pass this time. So we'd like the student to identify the responder's intention. So um, is the responder accepting or declining the invitation? And then we ask the students to write an appropriate invitation. Let us now look at some corpus informed activities and we are wrapping it up now and leaving some time for a few questions. So what could be some of them? It could be as simple as compare usage of synonyms in conversational English. My students always ask me, okay, what adjectives go with totally and what adjectives go with absolutely as intensifiers? And by leading students corpus search, we find out tendencies. There's nothing absolute there, right? But a corpus through an analysis of concordance lines and examples can show us some tendencies. So totally seems to have, um, you know, this tendency to pair up with negative adjectives, totally messed up, okay? Absolutely seems to have this tendency to pair up with positive adjectives, like absolutely gorgeous, absolutely stunning, and so on. We ask students to identify collocations. So in one of the book units, Express Your Feelings, we give students a very short list of frequent adjectives to describe feelings. And we ask them to search a corpus to identify the top two most frequent intensifiers used with each adjective, like, oh, I was totally disappointed, right? Or as simple as asking students to identify frequency of use. So what are the most frequent that's plus adjective expressions that are used to express an evaluation or surprise? Things like, that's awesome, or that's nice, or that's horrible etc. 
or forms of address. Like, okay, what's the most common and the most frequent, right? Hey, buddy, dude, or hey, man. And of course, hey, man. At least the last time I checked, because as you know, frequencies change. Or finally, we could ask the students to illustrate the use of expressions. We give students a list of invitation expressions and ask them to search a corpus for authentic examples of these invitations in context. I am wrapping it up right now. Um, moving on to the next slide. I would like you to, if you are able to, find these activities fully developed, fully fledged, and more of the kind in the Campus Talk textbook. Um, even if you are not able to uh, get hold of the textbook, I'd like you to go to um, the web address highlighted in blue there, and you can download for free um, listening resources of the textbook, or back if you could click one more line. Um, I am very excited to share with you that you could also access the free interactive campus talk workbook at the address provided there, just cut and paste. Um, this is a free resource that uh, your students can uh, use independently, individually, because Campus Talk is not just a textbook to be used in the classroom face-to-face -face or online, but also to use as a self-reference or self-study um, textbook. And so is the Campus Talk workbook. The last slide, I'm trying to share also something um, useful, potentially in the classroom. As you can see, this is a word cloud. Um, and this you can use in the classroom. You could definitely ask your students, Beck, if you could click everything in the slide now. Um, oh, you could ask your students to generate a word cloud using free word cloud generators online. And as you can see here, your students will discover the words of the highest frequency. The bigger the size of the collocation here, the higher the frequency of usage. And students can discover this colorfully, you know, in an appealing way, uh, individually, independently, by having fun doing that. Um, and that's basically what I planned to share with you today. Um, thank you so much for following and for your kind attention. And um, in the five, 10 minutes remaining, I'd like to take any questions. So maybe back, it would be easier if we could unshare the screen.